What do robotics, artificial intelligence, and deep sea exploration have in common? Our next speaker. She woke up this morning, jumped into the ocean, she lives on a boat, washed her hair, got dressed in some pretty flattering gear here. She is the founder of Blue Eye Robotics. It is my absolute privilege to introduce Christine Spitten. So I want to start to say that I'm honored to share this stage with uh, such a legend that Bruno, who you're going to hear after me, and Loretta that we just heard. It was such amazing. I was just sitting there on the tip of the chair and just like, space. But I'm, I'm just thinking about ocean. Maybe I should start thinking about space. Like <laughs> This whole thing about connection, I think, is really beautiful. And I'm going to talk um, a bit about that as well. But I'm going to bring us down from space down to planet Earth, and it's going to be about what's connecting um, humans, blue whales, and polar bears, because we all come from the ocean. So even though 94% of all life on Earth is aquatic, about two-thirds of marine life is still undiscovered. And we are constantly finding new species even in the shallow waters close to where we're living, that may redefine some fundamental theories on life in the future. So as Chris said, I have a very personal relationship to, to the ocean. Um, I have had a strong connection to the ocean since I was very little. I wanted to spend as much time near or in or on the sea as I possibly could. Um, and so now, today, I live in a sailboat, and I've done so for the past few years. Uh, wake up in the mornings and jump in, as you say, and wash my hair in the salt water, and not every day. But um, um, yeah, so that's, that gives me an extra meaning in my life. Um, and in the beginning, it didn't really occur to me that this interest and this passion for the ocean was something special or that it was something unusual about it. But after a while, I started to realize that, hey, there's actually people who find the ocean frightening. There's also people who've never set their foot on a boat. And in fact, most people on Earth has never even seen the ocean. But however, um, the most scary part or the most surprising part was when I realized that actually a significant number of us simply don't care. And how can someone not care about the element that gives us food, energy, even the oxygen that we breathe, and provide us with so much fun and recreational activities that we get to enjoy? Well, of course, the reason why they don't care is because they don't see the ocean through these eyes the way I do. And to most people, the ocean is just the surface keeping them away from this part of the world that's hiding below. They don't know that the ocean is the home to this guy. <laughs> this, is a, um, this is a barrel fish that was filmed uh, outside of the coast of California. He has a transparent head. And what you see there, the two green bulbs, those are in fact his eyes, protected by a shield against one of his biggest predators because they have stinging tentacles. And most people also don't know that the largest waterfall on Earth is not Angel Falls in Venezuela, but it's in fact between Greenland and Iceland, and it's about three times as high, 160 kilometers wide, 3,005 meters tall, but it's underwater. And, um, the ocean holds many secrets on human history and on our origins and the origins of planet Earth. And they are all there for those who want to see. And so this was the inspiration behind my mission to make the ocean available to everyone, to empower ocean exploration and fuel curiosity and create a personal connection between humans and the sea. 
So three years ago, I co-founded a company called Blue Eye Robotics, and we develop underwater drones. They can dive down to 150 meters, and you can get live video straight up to your own smartphone. It's all about lowering or removing the threshold to get to explore and be the part of this world. Because I figured that the first step to make people care is to get to see, to view, and to learn and experience firsthand. We were four engineers. We were sitting in a tiny little office up at NTNU in uh, Trondheim. We were lucky to have an angel investor who believed in us and believed in the, in the idea that we had, and who made us able to, um, to grow and to get the competence on board that we needed in order to create this product. So only 10 weeks after we founded the company, we had the first prototype ready. It was huge <laughs> compared to how it looks today, but I brought it with me on a sail expedition across the Atlantic Sea. Together with 13 other women, I was sailing from um, Senegal to Recife in Brazil, and we were on a mission to investigate the connection between marine plastic and people's health. And this prototype turned out to be the perfect tool for us to be able to map the plastic and trash on the seafloor. Since then, we've been working closely with multiple industries and also with private people to learn how we can create the best possible underwater experience. So we, it turned out that there's two factors. It's all about simplicity and availability. Together with scientists in Norway, we have been diving under the ice on Svalbard to uh, monitor the algae blooming of the ice algae. We've also been to the Great Barrier Reef uh, to search for super corals, corals that can withstand climate change better than others. And we've been um, following blue whales along the coast uh, coastline of Monterey uh, in California. And all of those experiences are amazing and extraordinary. But what we do most is that we take our product, we take the uh, Blue Eye Pioneer and the water drone, and we test it and test it and drive it in our own backyard, in the fjords of Norway. And I would never think that there would be so many colorful, alien-looking like little species living in our own backyard, just up in the Trondheimsfjord or in the Oslo Fjord. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't know until we had this tool. So besides recreational usage, there are different industries that can use this sort of technology. Um, because when you can go down to 150 meters and you can roam around for hours, you get to do quite some work. You get to uh, inspect and monitor, whether it's underwater installations or ships or uh, aquaculture sites, or if you're doing environmental monitoring or mapping trash on the seabed, or if you're using it as an educational tool. Search and rescue, just to mention um, a few. But the, despite being such an um, ocean nation or a marine nation, which Norway is, you wouldn't believe me when I say that we don't learn anything about marine biology or oceanography in school. Not until we get to university where we get to choose it as a topic. So our close relationship uh, relationship and history and experience to the ocean is very much limited to the surface. And what we then risk is to get an out-of-sight, out-of-mind approach. That's not a close relationship. That's not being connected to the ocean. So interacting with nature is good for us as well. Researchers have found that after only spending one hour out in nature, you increase your memory and attention span by over 20%. In other words, we need nature in our lives. And needless to say, when you get to get this close to marine wildlife, like this lemon shark on the picture, and you get to stay there and observe quietly, because you can use the slow-mo motion on our drone, and just observe and 
inspect their natural behaviors, you get a whole different um, feeling of being a part. And sometimes when we go on the very deep dives, there's this different deep sea fish that are very curious on a drone and like, hey, what's that, what's that strange looking uh, creature with a lead lamp on his nose? And they come around and uh, come up towards us and to the camera and, and really starts uh, to check it out. And it's amazing. And the ability we have to share this experience, we can stream it live. A whole classroom can explore the sea or connect to someone else who is on the other side of the world exploring on the Great Barrier Reef. A classroom in Oslo can, can be there with them, ask questions, control the drone from afar. It's really, it opens up a lot of opportunities. So by using what we call a digital dive mask, you even get to close out all other distractions and you get the fully immersive experience of being down there. This is John Rumney. He is head of science on Great Barrier Reef Legacy, one of our close partners. And what you see on this picture is John diving down to 80 meters in what they thought was a dead zone on the reef, which turned out to be full of life. And they even found some species of corals that they didn't expect to find. And you can see John is quite happy about that. And these guys were, by the way, helping out uh, during the production of Planet Blue, BBC series with David Attenborough, who is perhaps the most well-known advocate for ocean conservation and exploration that we have. And I had the honor of meeting Sir David, um, and we talked about the future of ocean exploration and what happens when you democratize the ocean and everyone gets to access. And I asked him, well, do you think, do you think we will survive? Will humankind survive on planet Earth? Or do we really need that planet B where we escape to because everything is going to hell here? And he said, well, yes. We will survive. The question is, what sort of world will we survive in? And then he continued, and he said, and by the way, we need to act now, and even if it's cost, because that's nothing compared to the cost of nature. And so I think we can take on Sir David's words, and I hope that all of you um, go out here um, from this conference today, fueled with curiosity, with a will to explore by yourself and get these first-hand experiences, and not only like or view documentaries, but put your phone, put your phone down. <laughs> put your phone down and go out and connect to nature um, and take part in the world that we have here today so that we can create the world that we want to live in, in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christine. I was deeply inspired by that. And I'm, I'm dreaming of a world where I can be sitting at my desk, stressing out, and then I can put on those goggles, <laughs> my ocean drone. So my question for you is, everyone here is obviously going to pre-order your drone, right? Yeah? yeah? <laughs> what is the simplest thing all of us can do in this room? One thing that no one should have an excuse to do, to become more curious and care more about our oceans, having heard you speak about them just now. I think being 100 meters from, from a fjord, it's pretty easy to just go down if you have the chance after this conference and just, just spend time with the ocean and dare to put your hand, head under it. And, uh, be a part of it, be close to it. It's not something you can quickly buy, it, buy it online or like, you need to be close to it. And I think, I think you, get, you get so much back just from doing that, from spending time with nature. Whether it's forest or mountains or sea, you get a completely different awareness. Um, and I think, I know, it's healthy for all of us. And I think when you, when you do that, when you stop being um, 
connected online or like connected to all these parallel realities that's going on. We all have our um, personal reality. If you stop connect to everyone else uh, reality and take more part in your own, I think it's really important. And I think it starts by asking questions um, and trying to really find those answers. Try something else than Google. Thank you very much.